So we should now all be uh, ready to start. Uh, on the 14th of December 1960, the 11th uh, session of UNESCO's uh, General Conference decided to create the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, an intergovernmental body with the purpose of uh, promoting scientific investigation of the ocean. For 60 years, the IOC has worked behind the scenes to enable its member states to act together to strengthen our scientific understanding of the ocean for the benefit of humanity. Today, the future of the ocean is also about the future of humanity. Without further ado, it is my honor to give the floor to UNESCO's Director General Audrey Azoulay. Excellencies, dear friends, I'm delighted to celebrate with you today the 60th anniversary of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. It is no coincidence that the Commission was created in the wake of the International Indian Ocean Expedition in 1960 to better understand what was at the time one of the world's most mysterious oceans. Following this expedition, hundreds of people dedicated their lives to making oceans a global commons. I would like to pay tribute to these far-sighted individuals because it's them who have allowed us to make incredible progress. Scientific progress, of course, because 60 years ago, oceans were a familiar but unexplored frontier. Thanks to the IOC in particular, 20% of the seabed has now been mapped, up from 6% previously. Secondly, they've allowed us to make progress in international cooperation. After six decades of efforts, oceans are now considered a global commons, even if the status has not yet been sufficiently enshrined in law. States have recognized that they must work together to manage the oceans, and that is what the I in IOC stands for. These efforts have been a wake-up call, highlighting that oceans are central to the challenges of our time. Challenges for populations, first of all, and particularly coastal populations who are vulnerable to threats like tsunamis. Before the, the 2004 tsunami, just one early warning system existed in the Pacific Ocean. And after this disaster, a global system was created, bringing together three additional tsunami warning networks, covering the Indian Ocean, the Caribbean, and the Northeastern Atlantic, the Mediterranean, and connected seas thanks to the efforts of all countries. Oceans are also central, of course, to economic challenges. They're home to major contemporary trade routes, play a key role in tourism, and are a major source of energy and food. They're, in short, uh, an essential component of today's economy, not to mention tomorrow's economy. And thirdly, and most importantly, oceans are the blue lungs of our planet. By absorbing more than 90% of the excess heat generated by global warming, they mitigate the disruptions we create. But for how much longer can they do that? And lastly, these immense areas where life on Earth began are fundamental reservoir of biodiversity, about which we still know far too little. Under the surface of the sea, whole continents of living beings have yet to be discovered. Another world is waiting to be explored. And it will remain unexplored if we do not make decisions and take collective action. Because despite this progress, research on these issues continues to be underfinanced. It's a message that we, we launched through our Global Ocean Science Report, uh, a report we're launching officially today. On average, less than 2% of national research expenditure is allocated to the ocean sciences. It is not enough, given all that is at stake. And that's why this report is also a call to action. The decade of ocean science for sustainable development is in this sense a historic opportunity. And I thank the United Nations General Assembly, which has just approved our uh, uh, decade implementation plan. It has 10 ma major priorities um, that have been established following extensive consultations with more than 2,500 partners over the past three years. And it gives us 10 years to better understand 
the great expanses that give Earth its name as the Blue Planet. To achieve this objective, the decade sets very amb ambitious goals on the major issues facing the ocean. These include mapping the seabed uh, by using digital technologies in particular, but also preserving and restoring marine biodiversity, and lastly, developing new tools for a sustainable ocean economy. We also have 10 years to open up the ocean sciences and correct the inequalities between regions, between generations and genders that were identified in our initial report. And lastly, we have to use those 10 years to explore, to explore uncharted area, areas, to create new partnerships, especially with the private sector and the philanthropic partners, and together find uh, new um, and innovative solutions for the ocean. Oceans are a new frontier for humanity, a new frontier full of promises and resources to be explored so we can rise to the challenges of our time. But they are also a space to be preserved, a place of uh, beauty and a reservoir of, for climate and biodiversity. In the light of the role they play for our societies, we must consider an ethical way of using the oceans to manage the resources more responsibly. To do this, we have an incredible asset, this Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. I hope that the decade to come will be as rich and as rewarding as the 60 years we are celebrating today. I thank you for your attention. A big thank you to Audrey Azoulay, uh, Director General of uh, UNESCO, for setting out what is at stake today and for these uh, very strong and inspiring words. It is now uh, my pleasure to welcome to the floor IOC's Chair, Ariel Troisi. Thank you very much, uh, Valerian. My name is uh, Ariel Troisi. I'm the Chair of the International Oceanographic. Oceanographic Commission, uh, which uh, is a community of 150 member states, all working to provide services uh, to a variety of stakeholders concerned with ocean matters around the world uh, and at all different scales, from global to local. I will have an, inter an opportunity to discuss uh, with our panelists uh, some of these issues later, but for the moment, I just wanted to wish you all a warm welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world and taking part. Um, today is a really special day. We're celebrating the first 60 years of the life of the IOC. And so I should like to invite you to enjoy this event uh, along with the rest of our community. And uh, just like us, uh, I know that you're as committed as we are to uh, protecting and promoting the ocean science. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gracias, Ariel uh, Let's now watch this video celebrating 60 years of IOC. <laughs> December 1960, the UNESCO General Conference establishes the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, IOC, to promote international scientific cooperation for our shared ocean. Ocean science now has a global home and a higher purpose to act as an instrument for peace through scientific collaboration. The early years of the IOC are marked by successful international cooperation efforts. soon becomes a central reference for ocean knowledge, data and information exchange. The 1992 Earth Summit is a turning point. Countries recognize the ocean as an essential part of the Earth's ecosystem, key to our planet's survival. Many countries keenly felt the need for rational management on ocean issues relate to both development and environment. IOC flourishes with the major programs in capacity development and systematic ocean observations. Born in this breakthrough era, the Global Ocean Observing System underpins accurate weather forecasts, hazard warnings and climate knowledge. In the 80s at a meeting in Geneva, I was told oceanographers don't need real-time ocean data. 
How silly does that sound today? For the times ahead, our efforts need to be greater than ever. We need to educate governments. The 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami is a tragic reminder of the importance of ocean knowledge for our survival. But our member states meet the challenge. All major ocean regions are now covered by tsunami early warning systems and communities across dozens of countries have been certified as tsunami ready. IOC也是呢，百分之八点五的感触，可是，在那个时候，它没有受到任何的损害，它只是被淹没了。它只是被淹没了。它只是被淹没了。它只是被淹没了。它只是被淹没了。它只是被淹没了。它只是被淹没了
and co-sponsored the World Climate, the Second World Climate Conference. This was important in trying to bring in the whole ocean science community into that realm of world climate research, as well as the linking of the ocean, ocean importance to the changing climate and the role of the ocean in the climate. From there, we jumped into the uh, 1992 uh, large event in, um, in, the, in, the, in Rio. IOC contributed to the formulation of the uh, Agenda 21, in particular, Chapter 17, but also participated in the negotiations regarding the creation of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The, the, uh, uh, this was important also in relation to trying to bring in the ongoing endeavors within the international ocean exploration decade uh, going on for 1970s, in which IOC strongly participated in trying to facilitate participation. Finally, in 1994, at the end, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea was entering into force. This, of course, was a mayor event, and uh, the li lifting or elevating uh, marine research and uh, technology into some sort of legal status. The IOC had participated strongly in the, um, in the negotiations and contributed by trying to link the scientific community with as best as we could. Also, with reference to the international ocean decade for the exploration going on at the time. Uh, we celebrated that by organizing a second global conference on oceanography in uh, Lisbon, strongly pushed by Dr. Mario Rivo, who had been my predecessor as secretary and who was then the Portuguese representative in IOC. During my period, I would like to refer just briefly to the fact that we also built very strong regional programs, continuing the development which had started uh, with the Indian Ocean Exploration 1960-65. But I would like to highlight that we had a strong development at the Western Indian Ocean with participation of um, African member states, as well as the island states there, and strong support by, the, the, by several member, uh, member states donors. On the other side, in the central eastern Atlantic, we endeavored to bring in all the African countries on that side in a regional program, which was supported strongly by several of the member states. We even organized regional cruises on a ship from Nigeria. We finally, when, we, when I worked in the IUC, we had a number of associate experts who came in and who worked there for a limited period of time. Uh, they were very in, instrumental in bringing some new stuff into the activities, also some hope for the future. Uh, we were working under limited conditions uh, regarding resources, of course, this is natural and normal. Uh, but the fact that we managed to obtain so many young associate experts was very encouraging. Some of them are still around, like Julian Barbier the, uh, and, and Henrik Enevoldsen in Denmark and Salvatore Rico. Finally, the future. Obviously, ocean is influencing all parts of our society. And I think that's needed to be brought out. And the science can contribute as far as I am concerned physical oceanography is required in trying to understand better the deep water circulation, deep water formation, and how upwelling interior as well as along the coastal boundaries may influence, for instance, the ice conditions in Antarctica, where the upwelling occurs as well. In the upper layer, concern is expressed for the situation with western boundary currents. They are important in transferring heat from low latitudes to high, are they being influenced? To what extent? Thank you very much. Thank you, Gunnar. Thank you, Gunnar Kohlenberg. Uh, joining us now from Chile is Dr. Patricio Bernal, former IOC Executive Secretary uh, from 1998 to 2009 and Program Research Director at CISRO Coastal and Marine. Dr. Patricio Bernal, what are the two key achievements that were significant according to you? 
I think the first one is certainly the consolidation, the building up and implementation of the global ocean observing system. During my period between 1998 and the year 2010, a significant push by the scientific community and by governments enabled the implementation and realization of the global observing system, achieving a major uh, goal that is the resolution of the physical variability of the ocean, uh, the transport of heat and momentum of the ocean today is perfectly forecast six, seven days forward, allowing us to understand much better the dynamic uh, interplay between the ocean and the atmosphere. That I think was probably the underlying major achievement. But in response to the uh, December 2004 disaster in the Indian Ocean, the big tsunami, we jumped immediately uh, the, the next day in order to respond to that by enlarging the coverage of the tsunami warning system that as uh, the Director General just mentioned this morning, only was existing and operating in the Pacific Ocean we to expand it to the rest of the world where there is a menace of tsunamis. Today, I can walk even in, in the beaches of my own country and see the alert systems, the warning to the people, the, the, the pointing of the evacuation routes that are now uh, all over the place and where we didn't have them before 2005, 2006. The IOC really, really uh, achieved a major uh, progress in, in preventing uh, and preparing populations and societies for these major disruptive events as tsunamis. We still have a, a way to go. Uh, that's, uh, uh, soft technology, the institutions that can really uh, prepare societies to respond to this kind of uh, catastrophic events are weak. And this brings to another important development. I think during that period, uh, we managed to keep uh, engagement with the scientific community on one side through the World Climate Research Program and many other programs sponsoring the research that sustained the recurrent uh, reports of the IPCC every fourth year. And this, uh, this is an essential job of the IOC because without the, that planning, we wouldn't have the papers, the scientific paper produced, the research done that will sustain an objective assessment of climate change. A little known uh, uh, pa past history of the IOC is the role that the IOC played in the, in, the, in the climate research. In 1979, IOC and SCORE co-sponsored uh, the first committee on climate change and the ocean, CCCO. And Professor Roger Rivell from the USA, at the time very much involved in IOC businesses and presiding the, the USA delegation to IOC, was his first chairman. And this was charged with st studying the role the, that the ocean play in climate change. And we now know that 93% plus of the excess heat generated by climate change is stored in the ocean, luckily. Otherwise we would have already an increase in temperature on the surface of the earth of more than three, four degrees. And also, we also learn by monitoring long-term the changes of uh, the concentration of CO2 in the ocean, that the ocean was suffering a second different impact from the burning of fossil fuels, its acidification. So that was a, 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 a major a contribution that the IOC made from the science angle to understand the full-fledged impact of the ocean on the regulation of climate in the planet. 
Thank you, Patricio Bernal. We will talk again about uh, challenges for the future in a few minutes. Uh, thank you for pointing out all these uh, solutions that were brought uh, by the IOC. And with us from Canada is Dr. Wendy Watson Wright, former IOC Executive Secretary. You were uh, Executive Secretary from 2010 to uh, 2015. And now you're also Chief Executive Officer at the Ocean Frontier Institute. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Wendy Watson Wright, what would you say are two uh, key achievements and why? Uh, merci beaucoup, Valériane. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. I just thank you like very much, uh, Valériane. Thank you. Prince Edward Island. Sorry, my um, mistake. I had been be given here. some uh, wrong information. Thank you for correcting that. That's okay. That's quite all right. Uh, I would say when it comes to the ocean, the level of attention has waxed and waned over the years, but I think we have an unlevel or uh, an unprecedented level of interest by many, many different uh, uh, parts of society right now. Um, certainly the IOC has been there for all of that. We've, we've heard about the IODE, about tsunami warning systems, about harmful algal blooms, the WCRP. Uh, these are all significant successes for the IOC and there are so many, we can't name them all, but we want those to carry on. And I'm sure that the Global Ocean Science Report 2020 is going to add to the prestige of the IOC. But I'd like to mention just two uh, I would say more recent milestones that not everybody would know about. The first is the acknowledgement of the ocean's role, the critical role in climate change. Now, the scientists have known this for decades. We know that, but the politicians didn't know it. And I, I recall in 2010 at the UNFCCC, the climate change convention in, um, in uh, Mexico, that one of the delegates said to me, what are you doing here? You, you deal with the ocean. This is about climate, not the ocean. So. Um, you know, there, there was a significant way to go in terms of educating politicians. Um, but uh, from then, and uh, obviously much earlier, as we heard from Patricio, uh, it took time. We worked with partners, largely the Global Ocean Forum, and Biliana Sissinsane especially, uh, may she rest in peace. Um, but we worked on ocean days and side events with many, many partners. So uh, the COP21 in Paris, seeing the ocean and climate platform be uh, formed and also seeing the blue COP in Madrid last year was very heartening. The second milestone, I would say, was in the adoption of a sustainable development goal specifically for the ocean, that's SDG 14. Uh, certainly the IOC, along with partners, of course, worked diligently for many, many months to promote and uh, advocate for SDG 14. And this included leading on the interagency publication, a blueprint for ocean and coastal sustainability, which is still a very good reference document. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that without SDG 14, we would not have a UN uh, ocean envoy and we would not be celebrating the UN decade of ocean science today. So uh, I would say well done, IOC, and I will save my remarks for the future for later. Merci beaucoup, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy Watson Wright. Uh, Professor Shu Jilan, former IOC chair from 1999 to 2003, and professor at the State Key Lab of Satellite Ocean Environment Dynamics, is with us as well. Uh, what are the key achievements you would like to talk about? Yes. Um, well, the global ocean is critical for the life on Earth, you know, including the climate change Wendy just mentioned. Uh, the coastal ocean, however, are very important for the development of the neighboring states, especially the developing states. Thus, you know, along this line, I would choose uh, two, uh, two issues. The first, of course, we know that the IOC, when it was founded, its mandate was mainly for the marine science investigations and the related ocean services. Then, you know, in the 1999, after the, uh, the Rio conference in 1992, of course, the, uh, the IOC member states thought that you know, the ocean management issue should be covered by the IOC as well. So therefore the IOC in 1999 then reformulated his, uh, his, his own uh, statutes. 
and was was adopted by the UNESCO. And so, so from then on, then the IOC can address the issues of both development and the environment. I think that's a very important issue. Without that, you know, uh, mandate, then IOC cannot fulfill the responsibility of the of the uh, the SDG fourteen, for example. Under this mandate, then the IOC, you know, then began promoting the so-called marine spatial planning and uh, sp spatial planning. This is a very important tool for the implementation of marine ecosystem-based approach to the marine, marine developments. And from then on, you know, IOC has been a world-leading institution in promoting MSP, the, the marine spatial uh, planning. And recently, uh, as far as I understand, the, in, 19, in 2017, IOC further joined force with the European Commission to accelerate the MSP processes worldwide. I think you know the uh, if you look at the developing countries, I think you know the the ocean activities, the ocean economic activity will will increase in in the future. So therefore, the uh, how do you develop the in the ocean at the same time you preserve the environment is a very important issue. I think the MSP uh, spearhead by the IOC will be imp very important tool for the countries to adapt to that. Of course, you know the. Uh, uh, yeah, for me, you know, I, I believe in that the the fishery the, the fishery is, is is a very important part of the uh, ecosystem, and therefore the IOC in the future, I hope you know, will interact more strongly with the fisheries uh, organizations internationally and regionally, because you know we address the ecosystem. The fish is a very important part of the, that ecosystem, so I hope the uh, IOC, you know, in the long term will also develop strong interaction with those inst institutions, organizations. Thank you. Thank you to you as well, Professor Shu Jilan. Uh, Professor Peter Hogan is also with us from Norway. Uh, you were the IOC chair from 2015 to 2019 and a co-chair of the high level panel expert group as well as uh, the program director at the Institute of marine research. What would you say uh, are some of the key achievements of the last 60 years and why? Thank you, Valeria. And, and listening to all the others, I could say that it should be a long list, a very long list. And I, and I really appreciate all the other comments. I think in, in, in my time, uh, we started the International Indian Ocean Expedition 2, which is still ongoing and actually leading the way into the decade. Uh, and, and has just sort of to prove its long-term value. I guess it's too early to judge, but it's it's linked closely to the first international Indian Ocean expedition, and that was be well before my time. But it's uh, has set its its mark and imprint on not only the IOC but I think international uh, collaboration in oceanography since that time. So it's it's uh, very important, I think, to to recognize that, and that was the way in which. Uh, governments and scientists and institutions worked together in the 1960s and really set the, 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 the course forward. Um, today we are working in a slightly different mode. We are moving from the exploration a decade that also Gunnar Kuhlenberg mentioned into a decade for sustainable development. And, and the International Indian Ocean Expedition 2 is actually a bridge into that decade in many ways. Uh, but the other thing I would like to, to highlight, uh, um, also from, from my period of activity, moving into, into uh, my, my chairmanship period, was that we talked a lot about not only the problems of the ocean, which are many and which require a lot of attention, but also looked at uh, the, the possibilities uh, from the ocean. We looked at the, uh, the new opportunities that new science could bring from the ocean. Try to highlight that the ocean is not only a place of problems and environmental issues, but it is also a place where we can find solutions to the challenges ahead of, of not only the ocean, but the global as a whole. And I think that is, uh, that is uh, started well before the, the Agenda 2030 was uh, adopted, but it's uh, been growing since then. And, uh, and I think it's going to be 
a way uh, to make uh, attention um, to IOC and to the ocean state and improving it from many, many ways uh, more productive in the future. So I'm happy to see that we are moving towards uh, an understanding of the role of the ocean in these various important properties like climate, but also a way for solutions to climate, solutions to food provision and solutions to many of the issues that are facing our, our globe at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Peter Hogan. So uh, many achievements have been uh, have been achieved during the last 60 years, as we uh, can see uh, through all uh, your words. Um, my next question is about how do you see the future? What could be some of the critical contributions that the IOC could make in the years to come, according to all of you? Uh, Gunnar Kronberg, maybe I'll ask you first. Sorry, yes, okay. Uh, I referred to them already before, but as a physical oceanographer, I think it is necessary that we try to understand how the deep water circulation is going on in quantifying it more and understanding also the deep water formation, whether it is changing, we know it is, but how much and to what extent is it forced by the climate variability and climate change. Uh, then there is the upwelling, which is occurring in some places along the Antarctica, which I think needs to be more quantified, as well as the interior upwelling. As I also mentioned, I think there is great concern for the western boundary currents and how they may respond to climate and other types of changes. These are my key issues. Thank you. Thank you, Gunnar Kohlenberg. Uh, Patricio Bernal, uh, what would you say uh, could be some of the critical contributions that the IOC could make to meet some key sustainable challenges in the future? I believe there is a major one that IOC is the best organization in the United Nations system uh, indicated to try to solve it. The United Nations uh, Law of the Sea uh, was uh, adopted with the concept that essentially all the benefits of the ocean should be equally available to all nations of the world. However, that premise cannot be accomplished because capabilities are not uniformly distributed over the world, but are significantly biased toward the North, the, the developed and rich countries. Therefore, this deficit of, of capabilities clearly make impossible that this ambition of the law of the sea of equal access and equal benefits to the resources of the ocean can be accomplished. The IOC is perfectly placed to try to address this imbalance. In addition to maintain the driving and drive the scientific research, the IOC is, could be critical to try to uh, form a level playing ground where the North and the South can benefit equally from the knowledge and, and, and resources of the ocean. This is, I think, a, a major challenge, and this is well, very well embedded in the concept of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. This will bring by the hand the participation or increasing participation of the social and human sciences, because what will make the difference is when governments and nations can benefit from the information in order to adopt measures, uh, manage better the resources, and this will require permanent observance system, will require permanent services system provided that information to governments. Today, this is still an ambition. It hasn't been accomplished, and we need to work in that direction. Very interesting point there indeed. Wendy Watson, right? Uh, what would you say uh, could be some of the critical uh, contributions in the years to come? Uh, merci encore, Valerian. I Rien, couldn't agree more you. with Patricio. I couldn't agree more with Patricio on the uh, the need for capacity development, and as well for as the inclusion of social and human sciences. And I think we're moving toward this more transdisciplinary approach. Uh, in addition, I think traditional ecological knowledge has to be melded with Western science. But um, I think that the IOC could and should uh, lead by example on equity, diversity, and inclusion. 
And uh, when you look, we've heard that from the DG this morning on, on gender and on uh, inequalities uh, among the regions. Uh, and I think it, we have to lead by example. For example, I looked at the number of executive secretaries. There have been nine since 1960 and uh, eight have been uh, male and one female. Um, and on the chairs themselves, and I think this is where member states really uh, have a role to play. There have been 17 chairs since 1960. We have never had a woman chair of the IOC. So it's something to think about. In addition, if we look at the geographic diversity uh, for the executive secretaries, six of the nine have been from group one from uh, Western Europe and North America. And for the chairs, it's a little bit better. We've had just under 50% uh, from, uh, from group one. So I think there's uh, much that the IOC can do in terms of leading by example on equity, diversity and inclusion. And um, I will leave that there. So thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy Watson. Right, a very interesting point there as well. Shu Jilan, uh, what would you say are some of the contributions uh, that the IOC uh, could need to meet again some key uh, sustainability challenges? Yes, I still like to return to the uh, the issue of the coastal oceans. The coastal ocean, you know, it's, it's very complicated. Uh, I agree with Patricia that you know we, we need uh, the capacity building for the developing countries, but actually the the lots of unknowns in the coastal oceans. So I think maybe you know for the next decade of uh, the oceans, we should you know devote more attention to the uh, to the to the oceanographic issues in the coastal ocean, and then we should deal with you know address the issue how do we balance the development and also. The, to preserve the environment. I think those are very important issues. If we don't preserve the coastal oceans, we will not have a good global ocean. Okay, just to say that, yes. That's all I want to say, yes. Thank you, Xu Jilan. Uh, Peter Hogan? Yes, um, many good points. I, I think I agree with all of them. Uh, internally uh, changes and leading by example that Wendy talked about and so on. What, what I was thinking uh, actually is uh, in a way supporting Su Jilan's earlier notion of coastal zone management and, and marine spatial planning. I think the IOC is set up to support the decision making of its member states and, uh, and that's clearly going to remain the main task for the IOC. But I really think when we look into the future, we should, should set the bar high and we should look way into the future, the long-term goals. And then I think we should aim to support the decision making, not only inside the exclusive economic zones of each member state, but also for the global ocean, the areas beyond national jurisdiction. So once we get the uh, EEZs right, 100% good management in the e exclusive economic zones, we should look for the areas beyond national jurisdiction. And there are processes with the UNCLOS, with the biodiversity there, which really require attention and also gives possibilities for IOC to lift science and, and knowledge sharing into that process in a very good way, I think. And the other point, which is actually quite related, is that when we develop assessments of the state of the ocean, which we are doing, there's a world ocean assessment soon coming in its second edition. Um, I think we should aim to make those assessments, particularly the global ones, but also regional, more based on the data and observations that we make in oceanography. They shouldn't be left so much to qualitative interpretation. We should have comparable ways of looking at that in a similar way that we are doing now with the Global Ocean Science Report, which is comparing science capacity. We should base on data uh, assessment of the actual state of the ocean. And that should be a goal that should be achievable within the decade of ocean science, I believe. So thank you. Thank you, Peter Hogan, and uh, thank you all for sharing your highly valuable experience and expertise with us. We will now take some uh, questions from the audience, and I'd like to point out that a lot of people and organizations are uh, congratulating all of us and all of you for the extraordinary work you've done over the past 60 years on this anniversary day. Uh, so one of the questions we have is uh, this one. At a time when even states express disbelief in science, could you tell us uh, in which areas uh, the IOC has an exclusive expertise uh, capable to engage collectively? 
Who would like to answer uh, this question first? Valerie Ann? Yes, is Wendy with us? Go ahead, Wendy. What would you reply to this? Could you tell us uh, why the IOC has an exclusive expertise? Um, well, IOC is the only uh, body that I know of that has a mandate for every ocean basin on the planet. And it's the only UN body that's specifically devoted to ocean science. So its convening power is unprecedented. And uh, IOC has traditionally worked with partners and IOC will continue. I think it needs to expand upon those partners, uh, probably uh, work more with the private sector. It needs to continue with the partners it's had in the past, such as the uh, joint group of experts on the scientific aspects of marine environmental protection. That's a UN body with the International Ocean Institute. Um, but I think, again, everybody looks to the IOC to convene and to be the leader on ocean science and the transfer of marine technology. So um, that's it. <laughs> that's the mandate. And uh, it's the only ones that has that mandate. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy Watson Wright. And unfortunately, we only have time for one more question because we are running a bit late. So I'll take one more question from the audience. And it's this one. Uh, the IOC count now counts 150 member states. Why should other countries, including landlocked countries, join the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission? Uh, Peter Hogan, perhaps you'd like to answer this question? Yes, thank you. 150 was a milestone, uh, but there are almost 200 uh, total in, in the UN system, and, and uh, they are all free to join the IOC, no restrictions. Uh, I think uh, we're seeing uh, that also landlocked countries have benefit from the ocean, not only transport, but also uh, energy and food coming from the ocean. Uh, they are represented at various other UN uh, fora, and I think uh, it's a question, of course, for the smaller nations. Uh, we also miss some small, uh, you know, um, small uh, island states or big ocean states, but because they are so small, they don't have people to go to, to all different parts of the world and different meetings. But I think uh, we should devise mechanisms for having all nations in the world participating here and also making sure that we serve all of them. And, and uh, yes, you need the, the ocean. We all need the ocean. Then you all need a well-functioning IOC. Thank you, Peter Hogan. And thank you again to all of you uh, for sharing your views. I'm sorry, but unfortunately, that's all we have time for. As you've all heard, a lot has been achieved and a lot still remains to be done. As it has been pointed out, only 20% of the ocean has been mapped as of today. It is now my honor to welcome to the floor the Executive Secretary of the IOC, Vladimir Rabinin. Uh, Vladimir Rabinin, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Valerian. Uh, what you see on the slide is me in 1976, which shows really how the time flies. And that's exactly why I would like to speak also about the past as, as a benchmark for our current uh, uh, IUC work. So indeed, um, you know, in 1960, we had 40 member states uh, with one landlocked country. And, you know, you see on this slide a lot of uh, 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 empty areas. Uh, but now we almost covered the whole coastal line. And uh, I would like to say that these uh, uh, gaps in, 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 the, uh, in the coverage were replaced by uh, the uh, regional subsidiary bodies of IUC. And so far, we have only five uh, uh, kind of coastal member states apart and from the landlocked states that are not on IUC that are shown on this slide. So we are moving forward. IUC uh, was born in 1960 during the Cold War, three years after the birth of the, its closest partner of all times, the Scientific Committee on uh, Oceanic Research, which was established by International Council for Science in 1957, just at the start of International Geophysical Year. So wanted, based, wanting to, uh, to avoid another war, the world and governmental platforms need, were needed for cooperation, dialogue, data exchange, and IOC was acting as one for the ocean. That was still the time 
when uh, oceanographic discoveries were taking place. And it was actually the gist of IEC work during that time. But the world started to change. Um, the population grew exponentially. The pressures on the ocean from land-based sources also mounted. The greenhouse gas effect started to, to lead to, to visible warming. Now we entered the uh, geological epoch of Anthropocene. And um, actually, uh, uh, the health of the ocean started to, 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 to decline, despite it was considered invincible. In 2016, the first World Ocean Assessment stated that the humankind was running out of time to start managing the ocean sustainably. So the current role of IOC is truly vital to supply ocean science, to help the United Nations, to set the world on the path to sustainability. So this new role is reflected in the portfolio of IOC activities. You see uh, acronyms for many uh, largest programs and we work through functions. We uh, spearhead ocean research towards uh, unknowns in the ocean. Um, we move forward the observing system and then the management system. Um, uh, we coordinate various uh, functions, uh, various uh, services, including uh, warning systems for tsunamis. This information that we produce goes to various assessments, including the fact that IC is now custodian for the two targets of, uh, of sustainable development goal on certification and uh, scientific knowledge. And IC, of course, supports all kinds of frameworks, the sustainable development uh, agenda, the Paris Agreement, uh, biodiversity, and many other in, in other, uh, we work at the science policy interface. Finally, the function F underpins the whole work of IOC. We help member states to develop their capacity, train specialists with focus on developing countries, Africa, island developing states. The, and the ocean literacy in new development builds harmonious relations between humans and the ocean, making positive behavior of uh, uh, behavior, positive behavior change uh, possible. On top of that, we are now coordinating the decade of ocean science. So this is a huge portfolio and uh, this work is underway. So I would like to state that uh, our portfolio is guided by uh, the new vision. The ocean that we need to, uh, would like to have is scientifically sustainably managed ocean. And uh, I would like to refer to, to a recent example that was achieved by uh, the high-level panel on sustainable ocean economy uh, that committed to sustainably manage 100% of the ocean area under the jurisdiction of those, of those countries. Um, the, you know, less than two weeks ago, they issued uh, a commitment uh, and also highlighted that uh, there are fantastic perspectives actually in the ocean through data work combating pollution, linking to national economy. We may uh, sustainably manage the ocean and generate, generate six times more uh, food, 40 times more uh, energy through renewables, at the same time closing the carbon gap to the Paris Agreement target of 1.5 degrees warming. And also we can generate by 2050, approximately uh, 50 trillion US dollars equivalent. So, you know, this is, uh, of course, these perspectives are totally unthinkable. But, you know, for that, uh, we need to achieve some qualities of ocean science. It needs to be capable, it needs to lead to good actions, and also needs to be sustainable. I would like also to mention that there is no convention behind IOC like, United, uh, like other United Nations organizations have. Decisions of our governing bodies, because of that, are not truly legally binding, sometimes not even mandatory. That is why our hope now is the decade of ocean science will transform this paradigm and will make our science much more actionable. So I would like to say that there is still another big significant issue, the challenge to IOC. IOC uh, role uh, in terms of uh, contribution sustainability is totally incompatible with, with its size. A major increase is needed in the IOC regular program budget because uh, 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 originating from the UNESCO assessed contributions, um, this increase is not in the cards. This means that uh, the permanent staff of OEC cannot grow, uh, and yet we are able to uh, generate a lot of sufficient, uh, uh, a lot of extra budgetary funding. But uh, 
the IOC also needs to grow as, as this core program. So in 2019, uh, the IOC assembly requested executive secretary to develop a vision for fully resourced IOC. At the next assembly, I will present a vision of healthy IOC that can sustainably fulfill its current portfolio that you saw today in my presentation. I will also elaborate uh, what is the optimal IOC that is capable to, to chart for the world the way to the ocean we need for the future we want. So this takes me to the last slide. I would like to thank actually um, member states, the raison debtor of, of IOC, IOC officers who lead uh, IOC, IOC secretariat, that is the engine of all what is happening in our home, UNESCO. Also, and you can probably share the, the vision and, and, the, and the feelings from the previous panel. I would like to stand that we stand really on the shoulders of giants. I thank you all uh, past crews of IOC. So the next event for us will be uh, focusing on the Global Ocean Science Report that measures the capacity of ocean science. And after that, we will discuss uh, the decade of ocean science that paves the way to other uh, hopefully equally successful 60 years. Thank you, merci beaucoup, uh, merci beaucoup, gracias, spasiba, and over to you, Valerian. Spasiba, thank you very much. Merci as well to you, Vladimir Rebinin. Thank you very much for everything you just said. And uh, just a quick reminder, we have the privilege of having Teresa Veta, graphic recorder with us. She's creating a simultaneous uh, visual summary of this celebration. I, invi I invite you to have a look at the great work she's doing. It is now uh, my pleasure to introduce the launch of the 2020 Global Ocean Science Report, charting ocean science capacity for sustainable development. Uh, we will see how and why DGOSR is a key tool in supporting ocean science uh, for sustainable development and the use of the ocean. Without further ado, let me give the floor to the head of the science uh, section at the IOC, Salvatore Arico. Thank you, Valerian. Uh, greetings, everyone. The Global Ocean Science Report assesses in a systematic and quality controlled manner capacity in the area of ocean science nationally, regionally, and globally. The findings of the report are based on primary data provided by member states of the IOC, analysis of scientific publications and of patents by regions and globally, and data related to efforts by philanthropy and other relevant actors. The Global Ocean Science Report shows the status, but also trends in ocean science, research vessels, other research infrastructure, human resources, taking into account the gender dimension. Funding for ocean science is assessed as a proportion of the research and development envelope. This report is based on a rigorous methodology, including peer review according to the standards of scientific publications. The data underpinning the report are all available openly through a dedicated portal. The report is available freely and a summary of it is available in six languages, Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. I wish to thank, on behalf of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, first of all, IOC member states that have contributed financially and in kind to the realization of the report. The Republic of Korea, Belgium, Kenya, Ireland, Norway, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. On behalf of the IOC, I wish to acknowledge the work of all authors and contributors who have populated the report with their inputs on a pro bono basis, as well as the external peer reviewers. The report has throughout benefited from the able guidance of a wonderfully diverse, yet disciplined and gender balanced editorial board. All IOC and the UNESCO colleagues involved are hereby also warmly acknowledged. I invite you to enjoy and to utilize the Global Ocean Science Report 2020. 
Thank you, Salvatore. Thank you very much, Salvatore Arico. Uh, we would now like to show you this video featuring key messages from members of the GOSR 2020 editorial board. The oceans are essential for life. They help us regulate our climate, they provide us with food and many of the other services that are essential for our well-being. Ocean science is making a contribution to in-country dialogues, particularly those related to the blue economy and the achievement of SDG 14 targets. This knowledge is more than a matter of curiosity. Our very survival may hinge upon it. Global Ocean Science Report assesses for the first time the status and trends in research capacity around the world. The second edition of Global Ocean Science Report includes new measures updated information and new countries provided data and input to the report. In the Global Ocean Science Report, eh, se puede encontrar información muy estructurada, muy bien obtenida, muy rigurosa, que puede ayudar a los, no solo a los científicos, sino a los políticos y a los tomadores de decisiones a entender quién hace cada cosa, qué productos se obtienen, qué recursos se consumen, etcétera, etcétera. This report, like its predecessor, continues to underscore the uneven distribution and allocation of funding for ocean science within and among regions and countries. International collaboration is very important in ocean sciences, also as compared to other science domains. The more international collaboration we see in publications, the more uh, the citation rates of the papers increase. Nous sommes à un moment clé pour gérer au mieux les bouleversements liés à notre environnement, à la biodiversité et aux transformations de nos économies. La science et les océans ont un rôle clé à jouer. La énorme demanda de datos e información océanica en todos los sectores, el ambiental, el científico, el socioeconómico, El ámbito académico, privado y público requiere un gran compromiso de todos los países en generar y mantener la infraestructura de investigación en ciencias oceánicas. There is so much in there to put you on track for the science we need for the ocean we want. to presenting the main findings of the report, I would like to call to the floor Dr. Jacqueline Uku. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valeria. Thank you for being with us. Uh, on this auspicious occasion of the 60th anniversary of IOC UNESCO, I wish to welcome you all to the launch of the Global Ocean Science Report. And I'd invite you to walk with me through a brief presentation that gives uh, some highlights um, of this report. The 
preparation of this report was a global endeavor, which was led by an auditorial board of uh, 12 members from 12 countries. And out of these, uh, five were female and seven were male. I chaired, uh, I co-chaired the editorial board with uh, my colleague, Professor Yon Mays. And we had 35 authors, 19 internal and external reviewers, including UN academia, government representatives, and most of all, uh, we were championed and boosted by a strong secretariat team led by Ariko, Salvatore, and Christian at the IOC UNESCO. Our responses uh, to our questionnaire tool uh, was drawn from 45 countries. I'd like to highlight that uh, this report is just not another report. It's more than just a document. It will serve as a resource for policymakers, academics, and stakeholders who are seeking to access progress towards SDGs and uh, progress towards the UN 2030 agenda, and to also understand the potential of ocean science in addressing global challenges. I'd like to highlight that this report builds on the success of the first edition of the Global Ocean Science Report that was launched in 2017 and uh, there was broad interest generated by that report. And GSOR 2020 captures four new additional uh, topics. This particular report highlights contribution of ocean science to sustainable development, science applications that are reflected in patents. It provides an extended analysis of gender uh, in ocean science and human resources as well as capacity development. I'd like to highlight the eight key findings and the top findings of this work. The first one is that ocean science has direct implication for sustainable development policies and uh, ocean science can generate information that will be applied to management strategies and action plans in multiple societal sectors. We discovered from our questionnaire that funding for ocean science is largely inadequate. And this lack of support undermines the ability of ocean science to sustain sustainable, uh, to support and sustain provision of ocean information and services to humanity. We found that women continue to be underrepresented, especially in the high technical categories of ocean science. We recognize that young ocean scientists are growing and the level of support offered to them differs among countries. And we also recognize that the technical capacity of ocean science remains unequally distributed among countries and regions. And this imbalance is accentuated by short term and ad hoc funding for ocean science. We noted that the number of ocean science publications worldwide continues to increase, especially in countries of Eastern and Southern, Southeastern Asia. We found that countries are inadequately equipped to manage their ocean data and information, and this hampers open data access and sharing. And lastly, uh, we believe that this process uh, offers a systematic approach to measuring ocean science capacity internationally, and it's very closely linked to the SDG 14A target. Looking at ocean science and human capacity, we found that um, European countries have the highest ratio of researchers as a proportion of the total population. An example uh, is given of Norway and Portugal, who have more than uh, 300 employed researchers per million inhabitants. However, if we measure this same metric against uh, gross domestic product or GDP, the number of ocean researchers in some developing countries, such as Benin, Guinea, Mauritania, and South Africa, were comparable or even higher than numbers in some developed countries, such as Bel Belgium, Denmark, Ireland, and Sweden. Ocean science and human capacity 
also made us reflect on the space that female researchers occupy in ocean science. And we found that female researchers account for 39% of global ocean scientists. And this is 10% higher than the global share of female researchers in natural science. Participation of female scientists in international conferences was another indicator we used to assess the involvement of women in ocean science. And we found that uh, female participants account for 29 to 53% of total conference participants, depending on the science category and the region. And so we were able to conclude that female ocean scientists are visible and they're increasingly talking to the world. It has been a privilege to have participated in the development of this report. I thank you for your attention and now wish to invite Professor Jan Mays to present the remaining key findings of the Global Ocean Science Report 2020. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline Nuku. And uh, let's now give the floor, as you said, to Professor Dr. Jan Mays, Director of the Flanders Marine Institute. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uku. Five more slides with um, results, with uh, data from the Global Ocean Science Report 2020. And I will give you a final slide with a call to action uh, that uh, follows from this report. We measured the output of science. Firstly, like in the first Global Ocean Science Report, in terms of publications, you can see uh, in the left-hand graph that uh, global ocean science output is continuously rising, has been rising from the 2000 to 2017 period quite continuously, linearly. That's the blue line is the number of publications that rises from 40,000 to 120,000 annually. Uh, we see that um, this uh, is not very, uh, not spread equally over the world, actually. What you don't see in this graph is that uh, the publica publication output in Europe and North America did not increase to the same extent. And there was, that were, there was a significant uh, larger increase in the last years in Eastern and Southeastern Asia. What we also found is that competitive ocean science is driven by international partnerships. Uh, we measured the co-publication rate, uh, the co-publication rate of publications. And we can see that international collaboration uh, results in higher quality work. It means that uh, the more international the consortium of authors, the more uh, higher the impact factor of the journals the research tends to be published in. We didn't only look at uh, publications, but this year, this edition, we also looked at uh, patents. We, uh, took a look at the cooperative patent classification and saw that uh, uh, there are many technical field classes where ocean science patent families applications are uh, uh, found. Ocean science findings are converted into applications for society, uh, more specifically in the technological te technologies or applications for mitigation uh, and adaptation to climate change. We see that there are very frequently ocean science related technologies uh, to be found. And this reflects the increasing recognition, of course, of the ocean's role in regulating the climate and the negative impact of anthropogenic change on ocean health. Ocean science discoveries feed into nearly all sectors of the economy, not only the blue economy, but uh, all economy that uh, we looked at. Uh, with regards to marine technology, uh, we looked at uh, access to technical infrastructures required for ocean science. And we see that this remains unequally distributed uh, over the world. Countries in the Southern Hemisphere only have limited access to ocean science technologies and infrastructure. Uh, the total number of research vessels in the uh, world is uh, 920. Uh, only a small percentage of these uh, are really uh, operational at the global or international uh, scale. And these are mainly operated by uh, Northern Hemisphere countries. The USA namely uh, has a, a very large uh, take in this global research fleet. So access to the open ocean is not a given. Uh, we should... Uh, be careful in balancing this towards the future, making sure that all nations in the world have access to seagoing capacity. 
uh, with regard to investments in marine science. There are large differences in countries' investments. Uh, but on average and in global, they are quite low, eh? like Dr. Uku already uh, indicated as a main conclusion of the Global Ocean Science Report. On average, only 1.7% of the national research budgets are allocated for ocean science. Uh, some countries do better, but uh, most countries do worse. Uh, uh, it's a range from uh, less than 0.05% to close to 12%, but that's a very rare figure. Uh, and then again, this is a very small proportion as compared to the value of the blue economy, the ocean and uh, the contribution of the ocean to the global economy. Uh, these are 2010 figures, but of course, since the blue economy is growing, we can expect that the disproportionate investments, the disproportionately low investments in marine science are only getting uh, more conspicuous. A final result uh, of the uh, Gosser's questionnaire to member states that we found that uh, with regard to the ocean sciences supporting sustainable development and the management of ocean resources, that uh, many countries lack a specific strategy to measure progress towards achieving uh, the SDG 14. Uh, 37 countries responded to the related uh, Global Ocean Science Report 2020 question. And we saw that although over 70% of strategies and a roadmap to achieve the goals of the 2030 agenda, only 21% reported that they have a specific strategy focusing on the ocean and SDG 14, our SDG on life below water. So going uh, to the summary, uh, the, the, the action plan basically that we uh, connect to this Global Ocean Science Report 2020, there are nine uh, recommendations. First one uh, deals with uh, funding. Uh, overall, funding for ocean science is insufficient to fill existing knowledge gaps and to deliver the information required for decisions, tools, and solutions leading to a sustainable ocean. Secondly, we should uh, establish continuous collection of data and monitoring of ocean science investments is instrumental to identify there are multiple socioeconomic returns at the national, regional, and global scales. Thirdly, we should facilitate co-design of ocean science. Uh, it's necessary to identify challenges and opportunities for action in support of ocean sustainability. And the ocean decade, we believe, can serve as the platform for ocean science co-design. Uh, fourthly, uh, we should promote multi-stakeholder partnerships in ocean science and operationalize the transfer of marine technology. Very important, should establish partnerships, south-south, north-south, but also cross-sectoral um, as vehicles to improve marine research capacities and to optimize research infrastructure and human potential uh, throughout the world. Number five, we should move towards ocean science capacity development with the equal participation of all countries, genders, ages, and embracing local and indigenous knowledge. Uh, the basic principle should be there that we will leave no one behind uh, and providing equal opp opportunities for all countries, genders and age groups. Uh, six, we should develop strategies and implementation plans to support the specific career needs of women and young scientists. Uh, we should find solutions to remove barriers for open access to ocean data, very importantly, the data is a starting element of, ocean science, of the ocean science value chain, and we should uh, recognize ocean data uh, as a common good. Uh, one but last, we should foster education and training in professions related to ocean science. The world will need a lot of marine professionals in various fields of ocean management, and we should invest in this. And then finally, uh, something that popped up uh, while making the Global Ocean Science Report 2020, of course, is that we should assess the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on human and technical capacity in ocean science. Uh, the data in the Global Ocean Science Report 2020 can be seen as a pre-COVID-19 uh, 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 T0. And we should, in the next uh, edition of the report, examine the impact of the pandemic on ocean science on core funding on investments uh, by the private sector in scientific outputs, uh, observatories, uh, and, and the likes. Uh, 
We will conduct an intermediary study that will uh, be undertaken starting in 2021, and the results of which will be accommodated in the next edition of the Global Ocean Science Report. And that's my final slide. Uh, uh, I hope that you enjoyed the Global Ocean Science, Science Report 2020. It's much better than the first edition. And the next edition, of course, will be better still as more member states set up procedures to capture high quality data and submit them to the IOC. Uh, I want to stress that uh, the Global Ocean Science Report 2025 is not only a book and a PDF, but there's also a Global Ocean Science Report portal that contains all the raw data and all the products that are derived from these data. So enjoy reading and enjoy exploring. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Jan Mies. Moving on, IOC's Chair Ariel Troisi is also with us. Uh, Ariel Troisi, what do you think about the conclusions of this report? Well, thank you, uh, Valeria. And, and uh, this Global Ocean Science Report is showing that there is still tremendous scope for further collaboration among nations, among stakeholders, uh, especially from perspectives of uh, walking the talk of the important question of transfer marine technology, where equipment uh, laboratories, access to infrastructure and projects, experts and expertise is heavily involved, uh, and, and the transfer technology uh, will continue to play a major role in maximizing social benefits to, to the ocean and the services it provides. So I, I wonder, and I would like to thank uh, Jacqueline and uh, and and uh, and Jens, uh, for for their chairing of this great group because now we have a great document that it's critical for proper management and informed decision making. So I wonder, I have a couple of questions that perhaps we 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 can accommodate to to the chairs of this panel, uh, this uh, editorial board. One is how. How do we see transfer marine technology? How they, do they see transfer marine technology evolving in the future? And the other aspect that has been mentioned, and it was identified also in the preparation phase of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. If we are calling for a true transformation in ocean science, and the human component is a critical ingredient of this recipe, how can we also transform the way in which we develop this capacity in ocean? so as to provide the services from ocean science to society and overcome barriers that are, I like to call the three Gs, gender, generation, and geography, leaving no one behind. Uh, I, I, as chair, I consider the findings in this report of uh, great relevance for the future. And strategic investments in ocean science will be instrumental to enhance the chances of success we have collectively in this decade. So, uh, back to you with this with this comments, Valerie. Th thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Ariel Troisi. Uh, I'd like to say uh, to the audience that if you have any questions regarding uh, the report, please know that the team will be happy to answer them. You can ask them uh, your questions on the dedicated webpage of the IOC Global Ocean Science Report 2020. And of course, you'll be, you will be able to download uh, the full report on that official page as well. I think uh, we got a pretty good idea now uh, that of how ocean science can deliver key services to our societies. And now we can turn towards the future with the upcoming launch of the Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, a historic opportunity, which will be launched very soon in 2021. First of all, I would like to invite to the floor Craig McLean, member of the Executive Planning Group of the Ocean Decade and Assistant Administrator at the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration in the United States. Craig uh, McLean, can you explain to us what is the Ocean Decade and why is it a great opportunity for our world? Thank you very much, Valerian, and congratulations to the IOC on 60 years. I'm very proud to be able to deliver an explanation. I'm sure each member will have their own explanation and emphasis. But if we could start, please, with the first slide, I would like to just remind our friends and our colleagues of what the history is of 
an opportunity in front of us. So first, if we go back in time, there was during the 1950s and 60s, along with the history of the IOC, there was a societal move that really brought us to the point with the writings of, for example, Rachel Carson and Jacques Cousteau of an inspiration in the oceans. And I would submit that we have the same inspiration here today with the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. That would be a global reminder of the importance of oceans, but also a recruiting tool to bring many constituencies who are not today engaged in understanding the value of the oceans. And I would remind folks that with the historic view of the, if I may please then have two slides advanced, thank you. The, the historic reflection and current reflection of where we are today with the change in the global environment as this slide represents, where each of the indicators we see here are causing alarm and concern and do relate to the oceans. And of course, the ocean's impact on society, both the economy and the quality of life of all global residents is very important to us. So as we move to the next slide, we can see that in any of the most recent global ocean meetings, our ocean, the UN ocean meeting, the economist, many of these meetings and others have really dealt with the same commonly identified problems that are very challenging for us at this time. And we see then the solution, which is in the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and the Implementation Plan, which has been proudly developed by the IOC. The next slide, please, then will show us that we really are moving scientifically from the ocean we have to the ocean that we want. And with the various scientific objectives that we have to achieve here of a clean ocean, healthy, productive, predicted, safe, accessible, and please ponder the last one, an inspiring and engaging ocean. There is a wonder to the ocean that many people find appealing and they don't yet understand all of the value propositions in each of the other objectives. That's our job to present it. So the future for us is to provide the science that we need through the forum of the IOC, but through many partnerships in order to achieve, as we see here, what's on the next slide, the decade challenges that which is comprised in the decade's current implementation plan. By no means is this a finite list. This is the starting list at the beginning of the decade. But you will see in this list of 10 areas, many of the attributes that were cited earlier, but also those that we see in our ambition for the future. So as we then move forward, please, to the next slide, I could remind you that we have a marvelous array of partnerships that can be assembled. This is just but one delegation's work in terms of generating partners, but those partners are largely already those who are ocean initiates. Those are fellow agencies, those are professional societies, those are vessel operators. These are people who are ready to join domestically and globally in order to contribute to the decade. But with the next slide, please consider the many constituencies that we need to recruit and encourage in the co-development, the co-design, in understanding what are those societal outcomes that will affect each of these components, these industries, these sectors of society who may not themselves have an oceans department. We need to reach into these organizations and awaken them to the potential and invite their participation in the ocean science for the ocean we want. So as I conclude, if we look to the next slide, please. There is a once in a lifetime opportunity to make as big an impact as this UN decade presents to us. And we as members of the ocean science community have the responsibility to think boldly, to be seeking multidisciplinary input, to recognize and remind people of the impact to the blue economy. There are components of industry, private sector and philanthropy who have marvelous contributions to make and we need to help guide their participation and invite them into the opportunity that the decade presents. So I ask you to think big, think boldly, and to be that outrageously imaginative community that I know the ocean science community can be, invite your colleagues and bring them forward because our future in oceans is dependent upon the decade, 
I am confident in the success of the decade. I am confident in the success of the IOC and member delegations to bring this forward. And I'm excited about the potential to see this fully realized. Let's get busy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Craig McLean. As you were saying, let's get uh, busy. Let's now welcome to the floor Patricia Meloslavich, Executive Director of the Scientific Com Committee on Oceanic Research, College of Earth, Ocean and Atmosphere. Uh, Patricia uh, Miloslavich, uh, why would you say that the ocean decade is an unprecedented opportunity? What do we need for our future? Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and congratulations IOC for this great achievement. So yeah, so the, the, the main um, needs for ocean science for tomorrow, and the decade is definitely a great opportunity. These uh, ocean science for tomorrow will vary depending on the region as we live in a very heterogeneous world. Developed countries will certainly have different needs and priorities from developing countries as they have in many cases already established solid foundations and baseline knowledge, which is still in the building in developing countries. So to overcome this, reducing the gap between developed and developing countries will be critical in the next years. And for this, technology transfer and capacity building all the way end to end will be needed along with the geographic expansion of research, baseline and monitoring. But there are many needs that are universal and applicable to all regions. So some of these are that, that in the next year, we have a better communication across all ocean stakeholders so that the message of how relevant ocean knowledge is for our own well-being permeates and is understood loud and clear across society. We also need to continue to develop a solid foundation for ocean science that includes standardized and agreed best practices from data collection to data analysis across all ocean disciplines. And we need to continue to develop innovative and also ideally low cost technologies that facilitate data collection in a more automated way. This will require, of course, hand in hand, the development of big data storage and analysis skills, because as we will see more images, uh, image data, video data, genetic codes, sounds recordings, and so on. We also need to have fully functional and sustained global ocean observing systems that monitors essential ocean physical, biochemical, and biological variables to generate the data that not just scientists need, but also policymakers and managers to track ocean health, support early warning systems. This system will also allow us to better understand trends in the ocean over time, how the ocean changes and have the capacity to prepare society for these changes. We also need fair data, fair for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable data supporting interoperability, data aggregation and reuse. So in many areas of the world, good data really exists. And in this area, the next step will be to look at the data in a more holistic way, integrating across the different disciplines of data with physical, biochemical, biological data to have a better understanding of coastal and oceanographic processes from the shallow to the deep. We will see major breakthroughs in ocean science coming from multidisciplinary deep sea research as the deep sea has inevitably become the target for increased mining exploitation, adding to the existing pressures. We will see multidisciplinary microbial studies, their diversity and role in driving biochemical processes, including the global carbon cycle, which sustains life in the ocean and also controls the composition of the atmosphere. And of course, as we see now, the environmental DNA as a tool becoming more standardized and more accessible will allow us to better assess better our marine biodiversity distribution and abundance. So what would we be celebrating after a UN decade here from, from, from 10 years now? Well, if we are able to achieve everything that I just said, it would be just great. So we really would like to see after UN decade uh, concludes that the science is better communicated to all ocean stakeholders resulting in an improved understanding of why ocean science is important, how it relates to people, and having an increased awareness that people and the ocean are connected. What affects one affects the other. And for this, the scientific community needs to build more bridges to the rest of the ocean stakeholders, the industry, and also everyone, strengthening the existing partnerships and developing new ones. 
we need to have a, an ocean science that is better funded, better resourced. And these funds and resources are used more efficiently, sharing of infrastructure, but are also that are more equitably distributed and focus on specific needs. We also would like to see that we are effectively tracking how ocean life is responding to increase human use and climate change. And by doing so, we have empowered the global community to effectively predict, mitigate, and manage our ocean. We also want to see that we have reduced that gap between the developing and developed countries that I mentioned before, having more trained people resulting in improved local knowledge and more capacity. And also that these scientific discoveries and science products are better communicated, they're used, that scientific data informs policy and management decision decisions on a regular basis. And finally, that we see all these young people um, I was a professor for many years that we see all this uh, generation of early career scientists having jobs that they are positioned at universities, research institutes, government facilities and others. They have the stability to you know, release their creativity and their ingeniosity to, to take over the leadership on ocean science research and communication. So the UN decade will definitely bring together all ocean stakeholders, will help mobilize people and resources and target all areas that are relevant to the ocean. And is this therefore a lifetime opportunity to make a significant progress in fulfilling this needs. So that's how I, I see the next years to, to happen. And thank you very much for the opportunity to express my views. Uh, I would now like to pass on the floor to Alfredo Giron, member of the Ocean Decades ECOP. Alfredo Giron, uh, based on your experience, what are your views today and what do you expect from the decade? Hello, thanks Valerian. Um, I would like first to thank and congratulate the IOC, both for its 60th anniversary, but also for looking ahead by putting early career ocean professionals, ECOPS, at the core of all activities and for opening the door to drive a cultural change in how the global community pursues ocean sustainability. The fact that I am here today represents the IOC's commitment to intergenerational diversity and bringing on board the voices of those who will inherit the oceans of the future. But before I can answer to the question about what we as ECOPS need from the decade to manage tomorrow's ocean, I think it is important to recognize some of the problems that exist. According to the new Global Ocean Science Report, for example, ECOPS are not recognized as intellectual authorities and future leaders, even though many of us are working at the frontier of science, engineering, journalism, and basically every sector of society that you can think of. The Global Ocean Science Report also found that the opportunities for ECOPS are really skewed towards developed countries, as we heard before. Not everyone can travel to relevant conferences or has access to the networks necessary for their professional development. Finally, the report also found that the workforce in ocean sciences is getting older. How are we going to encourage young people to pursue a career in the ocean if there are no jobs available? Recognizing these challenges, however, is just the first step. And with the support from the IOC, we hope that the decade will have profound impacts to address each of them. So what do we need from the decade? We need the tools to build a global community of ECOP leaders that fosters knowledge and change, interdisciplinary research and multi-sectoral action. We need to open the door to have ECOPs be part of every working group and steering committee that will set the agenda of the decade and any other ocean sustainability movement in years to come. We need mentors those who have had a long career that teach us early in our careers to develop strategic thinking, multi-sectoral collaborations and recognition of opportunities and resources to drive real change. We need receptive minds that are willing to conciliate new ideas to address old and new problems. We need to be trusted as professionals. But in my view, this conversation shouldn't finish with our needs, but with the things that we bring to the table. Why is it so important that ECOPs are represented in every aspect of the decade? Well, because we bring new ideas through cutting edge knowledge and technological approaches. We bring our collaborative nature as long distances and geographical barriers don't mean much to us in the world we grew up on and which will only keep becoming more interconnected and collaborative. We bring open minds, enthusiasm, and the drive to make of this decade the turning point in which we streamline the way we use science to drive the sustainable future that we all want. I hope this is what we celebrate during the 70th anniversary of the IOC. 
and I will work hard along with my colleagues towards it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alfredo Giron. Uh, and uh, last but not least, we are joined by Asha DeVos, founder and director of Oceans Well. Asha DeVos, why is it uh, so important that the next decade and beyond focus on increasing diversity and inclusivity in ocean science? All right, great. Thank you for that awesome question. And thank you for inviting me to speak, actually. This is something that I'm incredibly passionate about. Uh, so obviously, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, if you look at our oceans and the current state that they're in, it's obvious that business as usual hasn't worked. And to shift the current narrative and trajectory, we need to be self-reflective and courageous. Courageous enough to admit that we haven't done a great job so far, and then to accept where we've gone wrong and why. And one way that we've failed ourselves in the realm of the ocean is really our lack of inclusivity and diversity. And while fail sounds like a really heavy, strong word, it honestly is possibly the best way to describe what has happened today. So think about it, right? If we, it, What if the solution to our greatest ocean challenge was trapped in the mind of a person from the developing world? Uh, after all, we do know that talent is equally distributed across the world, but opportunity is not. So by prioritizing diversity and inclusion, we're essentially respecting the unique needs, perspectives, and potential of everyone who works for the ocean in whatever capacity. So I'm not talking about just scientists and conservationists. I'm talking about anyone who has any passion or desire to work for the oceans. We're doing ourselves a favor because, let's be honest, to protect 70% of our planet, we need an army. There's no two ways about that, right? So leaving people out does much more harm than good. And we know this. At present, 70% of our coastlines are in the developing world, but representation from this part of the world is lacking. I think that's fairly obvious. Uh, more so in places where all the biggest decisions are made. So what happens is the decisions about our oceans and how to protect and manage it only truly, truly represents the thoughts of a few, a few from a part of the world that may be unfamiliar with another part of the world. Blanket legislation doesn't work. Blanket conservation options don't work. Common sense tells us that there are measurable benefits to solving problems with diverse teams. These include things like increased likelihood of innovation, more effective resolution of issues. Um, you know, having more minds in the room that come from different places really is the way forward. So in my mind, if we truly want to save our oceans, every coastline needs a local hero. Importing people from places that are unfamiliar with problems on the ground to solve those problems doesn't work. If conservation solutions are to be effective, we have to consider the local context and communities who undertake those actions. But currently, conservation professionals don't reflect the diversity of perspectives and experiences of the world, especially not those of the communities who bear the biggest burden for implementing that conservation action. A lack of appropriate cultural values and context leads to the develop development of ineffective and inappropriate solutions solutions, backtracking us further. Colonial science, where researchers and conservationists from the developed world come to the developing world, do research and leave without any investment in human capacity or infrastructure, doesn't work because the work is driven by the outsider's assumptions, motives, and personal needs, leading to an unfavorable power imbalance between those from the outside and then those on the ground. It cripples local conservation efforts because it often overrides existing work and quite, I, and in my experience, sometimes it even acts as if nobody's doing any work on the ground. And that's actually one of the big uh, ways that um, funding is garnered is by selling this problem in this exotic destination as unresolved as there's no one working on it. And actually that's not all, always true. The dependency on something external is also, of course, unsustainable. As you can imagine, once that team leaves, if a problem crops up again, uh, these local countries, these countries on the ground are dependent on uh, on that external support again. And that, that obviously isn't necessarily going to help in the long term. If anything, to learn anything from this year, this pandemic ridden year, uh, it's that we must work to build equal partnerships that are led by local heroes on the ground. Uh, these partnerships must be inclusive and respectful and approach with humility and a desire to listen rather than talk. If we create these partnerships, the work continues on the ground. 
I mean, in this this year, I've heard so many of my conservation colleagues complaining about the gaping hole in their data sets because they weren't able to travel to their usual field site across the world. My question to them was, well, why weren't you investing in your local partners? Why were they not equipped to do the work on the ground? Um, because if that was the case, it wouldn't matter if you couldn't travel because people would be there as soon as things opened up, they could get out there and collect the data. And that has been an incredible benefit for someone like myself who works here in Sri Lanka, who is Sri Lankan, who has been around and can basically deploy a team to do research as soon as our lockdowns end, as soon as there's a small window of opportunity. So most of all, I think we also have to move from talking to doing. We know what we've done wrong and we can do better. Diversity and inclusion is something we have talked about for long enough. Um, almost it, it's felt sometimes like it's something we need to tick off our list in the con in a conversation, right? So we've talked about it and it hasn't really done, we haven't done much more. But I think now it's important that we strategically build the means to move forward if we are to see success over the next decade. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to you as well, Asha Devos. We will now take some uh, questions from the audience and do stay with us. Uh, Asha Devos, uh, one of the questions is, uh, why is it so important that the next decade and beyond focus on... Uh, sorry, uh, my bad, I had the, the wrong question there on my screen. Uh, but what I wanted uh, to ask you is, in very concrete terms, how do you think that developed and developing countries can best work together in the context of the decade to overcome some of the challenges uh, you just described during your intervention? Yeah, so that's a really great question. I mean, I think there's lots of ways to answer this. Uh, I'm going to answer this in a slightly different way than I'm ex I think people might expect. So I'm just going to gi give you some points, right? The first thing I would say is if you're coming from a developed country to work in a developing country, um, I'd say never forget that working anywhere outside your, uh, your home um, is a privilege and not a right. I think that's the first thing to remember. Secondly, I would say, try to reflect on why exactly you are going to that other part of the world to work, right? Um, is, it, uh, is it for, you know, uh, career opportunity to, to basically um, grow your own career? Um, so, you know, is it ego driven? Is it, you have to be the PI, you have to be the face of the project, or if it's, truly about creating impact for our oceans, then you don't need to be the person on the ground. You can look at how do you build and create partnerships so that there are people who are local who can actually get the work done. The third thing I would say is approach, the, approach these partnerships with humility in the knowledge that capacity building, and we always use this word capacity building, and it, it's increasingly started to bother me and my colleagues, because capacity building uh, infers that it's this one-way transfer of information and one-way transfer of skill, which is actually not true. Because even if you come from outside, the people on the ground have a lot to contribute. They have a lot of knowledge on the ground that is absolutely imperative if a project is to be successful. So I think it's important that we think about these as a two-way exchange um, and that these partnerships are equal. Um, I would say also the other thing to think about is uh, how to become better listeners. Um, I think that's one of the things, you know, oftentimes people from the outside will come to our countries with preconceived ideas of what the project is, what it should look like, uh, without any prior knowledge of what the needs on the ground are. And that's actually detrimental. Um, but I think coming in with humility, listening to the needs of the people on the ground, the country that they're entering, um, and then looking at if, in fact, they can be so, a source of support support to address the issue, that's incredibly important as well. Um, and also, I would say, make sure that funds are equitably distributed because funds, money talks, we all know that. The minute an outside fund, and this is something that I would hope that funders will also think about if they're in the room right now. Remember, your money talks. So if you're funding an external organization, there's always going to be a power imbalance in terms of the money. Make sure that's not the case. Make sure that finances are equitably distributed. I mean, I was on a grant just a few weeks ago and I clearly talk about this as an issue and everybody on the grant who was from the UK was getting paid double what I was getting paid. And when I questioned it and asked for a list of job roles, 
they had no answer and they realized they had made a mistake. And this is not something that should be happening if we're trying to actually create impact for our oceans. So just to wrap up, I'll say that my organization here uh, in Sri Lanka, we, uh, it's called Ocean Swell. Uh, the way we do our partnerships is we identify the priorities for the country and then we invite partners in, people we know who believe in equal partnerships. We bring them in and then we ask them to help us to build and develop these projects and to guide the students on the ground. So we make sure we have local researchers who are the face and leading the project. So they're out there doing the work. And in the end, while they're also contributing to a larger project, these students uh, come out with their own individual projects. So there's ownership. They learn the whole process of science and research and actually conservation because then they go on to helping to write policy papers that can help with actually driving conservation on the ground. So those would be sort of my hot takes for uh, this question. Thank you for answering that question, Asha Devos. Uh, one of the other question, questions we have is, how can we ensure the decade is not used as an excuse to delay action? Uh, Patricia Miloslavic, perhaps you'd like to answer that one? Hello, yeah. Yeah, th that's a very tough question, <laughs> I see. So I don't think it's gonna delay action. On the contrary, I think the, the UN decade is an opportunity to engage in the actions that we have been sleeping instead of uh, taking action right now. So there's many, uh, Craig McLean presented uh, many of the challenges and many of these challenges are uh, immediate ways to actually start looking at things the way we, we want them to, to be. Of course, uh, we want uh, a transparent ocean that's something that's more predictable and safe and, um, and, and on all of the other aspects. And this is a way, in, in a way, the time that uh, researchers have been seeing as an opportunity to actually put together their science together for work along with societal needs. So in a way, uh, I don't think it's delaying, but on the contrary, it's accelerating. I think it will encourage the mobilization of resources. It will encourage that uh, more stakeholders get more involved, more engaged, more compromised into actions, uh, that, that we start working as scientists hand by hand with uh, with all the rest of the policymakers and with society, but there's something really critical here. And uh, it's very difficult for each of us to think outside of the box. What we need to do here is try to think outside of the box, reach out to, our, to whoever who we have on our side and try to explain ourselves better why science is, support, is important, why the questions that we ask from the scientific perspective are actually useful for the, just uh, the citizen that is just wondering what will happen to my future, where is the food coming from in the ocean, will I have security, will a storm clean up, wipe up my coast, will there be enough oxygen in the atmosphere, so all of these things that are questions that scientific science makes through better communication will actually permeate in society. So I think that is a really great opportunity and we think on the contrary we are accelerating this moment to come now rather than later. Thank you very much, Patricia Miloslavic. And uh, my last question will be for Alfredo uh, Giron, a question coming from uh, the audience. Uh, Alfredo uh, Giron, uh, how can partners who are listening to this panel and who want to engage ECOPES in uh, their work do that most effectively? What uh, mechanisms will exist during the decade to allow these uh, connections to be made? Thanks for the question, Valerian. Um, well, let me start by saying that we have had immense support to create an ECOP program for, for the UN decade um, of ocean sciences. Um, this was informed by a global survey that we launched last December and which identified the needs of early career people around the world. So we identified that different people in different parts of the world have different capacity development needs, different scientific priorities and different uh, arrays of expertise and, and sectors that are well represented. So we will deploy activities in focus areas such as peer-to-peer -peer and mentoring networks, 
sharing professional development opportunities, corporate sustainability, ocean literacy, and youth engagement. And over the last year, we have already created the framework to launch these activities as soon as the decade kicks off. And starting in January 2021, you can visit our website, ecopdecade.org, where you will find our calendar of activities, calls for applications to become part of our leadership teams, etc. We also want to recognize that what we are trying to build is a community movement. Every organization has to commit to their own ECOP community, recognize their needs, and proactively design the opportunities to further advance their careers. This is not a top-down thing where the, where the IOC is going to say like, okay, now people of the world give opportunities to your ECOPs or like, here's all the money that you need to do that. This has to come from the organizations recognizing that their early career people are valuable. So our role, once these organizations commit to that, and, and of course, we will be happy to provide resources uh, on how to do it, our role will be then to curate this global picture. And hopefully, in the next Global Ocean Science Report, we can report some of these metrics. How has the world addressed this issue? How, how far have we gotten in giving ECOPS opportunities? And then... Um, if you want to take some of these steps or if you simply want to get more information on how the decade will support ECOPS, please get in touch at contact at ecopdecade.org. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alfredo Giro. And then you just reminded everyone where they can get more information. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the three of you for sharing this, uh, these very enriching, enriching uh, viewpoints uh, with us. And I'm sure we are all very excited and uh, looking forward for the decade to start. Before we say uh, goodbye for today, I would like to give the floor back to IOC's Chair Ariel Troisi for the closing comments. Thank you very much, uh, Valerian. And uh, I hope you all have enjoyed and benefit from this great event as I did. I wish to thank, in first instance, UNESCO's Director General, Madame Audrey Azoulay, uh, for her continuous support to the work of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission on behalf of UNESCO as a whole. The years before us will require an increasingly strong IOC to tackle the problems of the ocean and transform this into opportunities. And for that, the support that UNESCO will provide uh, is instrumental. The commission will continue being driven by science, promoting peaceful dialogues between and among nations through international scientific cooperation and capacity building and inclusive access to data and information. The, the functions of IOC are clear. They provide a platform for organizing research and observations the coordination of warning systems to mitigate ocean hazards, inform and support ecosystem-based management, and build capacity in all of these fields for the benefit of us all. At the age of 60, uh, the IOC is thriving in clearly delivering value-added knowledge and services, but much remains to be done. However, and this was demonstrated by the findings we have just heard from the Global Ocean Science Report launching. In just two weeks, we will start the journey of our lifetime. The UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development will assist all ocean stakeholders to join forces in a federated and synergistic way. As the UN organization specialized in ocean science, the IOC will continue evolving with a clear vision for the future, agility in operations and impactful outcomes at the level of member states and globally. In this regard, the IOC officers, we have decided to present for consideration of uh, our assembly in next June 2021, a special declaration on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the creation of the IOC for consideration of the assembly through a dedicated resolution. And this will involve, of course, a consultative process that will be set in place uh, shortly. And there we will be able to describe the aspirations of an even stronger and visible IOC as the organization of the UN system specifically dedicated to ocean science. As I said, I hope you have enjoyed as I did today's event. We have had a chance to see where we are, where we stand and where we wanna be. I wish to thank all panelists for their enlightening contributions. 
Thanks as well to all participants in today's event. I've been following the questions and answers and very much appreciate all the good wishes and kind messages you have shared with us. Also, my thanks to our, to our dedicated Secretariat for their commitment and permanent and proactive support. My special thanks to all those who have devoted their time and efforts throughout the 60 years. For without you, without them, we would not be enjoying the tightly knit and forward-looking organization we have today. And finally, to early career ocean professionals, and allow me for a second, a nautical reference here. Get ready as six bells have rung and your turn at the helm is coming. Happy anniversary, IOC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ariel Troisi, for this very inspiring conclusion. And this closes today's special event. Thank you all very much for being with us on this very special day. A big thank you to all the participants and panelists for sharing your expertise and views. A warm uh, thank you to uh, member states for their ongoing support. And thank you, of course, as well to our interpreters and the audience for following this uh, special special event. Again, a happy birthday to the IOC. Enjoy the rest of your day and I wish you all a happy festive season as well. Take care. Thank you very much again. Goodbye.